thank you for the nice introduction and the analogies were on point. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'll be talking about robotics for regenerative rehabilitation after neurologic injury. Uh, I'm a 50 year PhD student in a lab and I've been I participate in some of these studies that I'm going to present today, and some of them I have seen and talked and discussed with Professor Rankins Meyer many times. So I, hopefully I'll be able to fill in his shoes here uh, and show you some, some of the amazing work that has been done in, in robotic therapy lately. So he asked me to share with you this message. So she's very, he's very thankful that, uh, for all your efforts. Actually, his mother uh, fell down and had a fracture on the T2 and a few other bones broke, but she didn't have any spinal cord damage, but she will have to go through a lot of um, rehabilitation at this point. So, okay. So I'm gonna touch three main topics today. So talk a little bit about the status of the robotic assisted therapy after a stroke. So especially stroke, because uh, that's the population we see the most in our lab, at least up to this point. Uh, but most of these studies actually apply for other neurologic injuries as well. I'll talk about generative rehabilitation after neurologic injury, especially some of the collaborations that we've had with people that have been using our technologies or that we're collaborating uh, doing their research. Uh, and I'm going to go into more details with the bimanual vending machine, which is a robot used for rehabilitation of non-human primates after spinal cord injury and stem cell therapy. Um, Finally, I'll talk a little bit about dosing. So, yeah, it, should it be longer therapy? Should it should be longer? Do we need more? Uh, where we are right now with that? So, well, why is stroke? So, one in every six people will probably have a stroke in their lifetime. About seven hundred thousand people every year in the U.S. alone have a stroke. So, it's a very it's a huge population. And this is a typical uh, stroke survivor. So one side of the body is very weak. We ask her to move her arm. She just can't. It's, it's devastating, like most of the other neurologic injuries. Uh, and in our lab, we've been trying really hard to find ways to get them out of this state. Luckily, it's not only us. So that plot on the right shows the number of uh, publications in robotic therapy in the past 30 years. So it has been growing exponentially. Uh, and most of the therapy looks very much like this one that uh, you see in the video. So the robot basically assists um, patient-initiated movements. And very similar to what a therapist would usually do, just uh, in this case the robot is doing. So we can couple it with games and daily life activities uh, that, that will help them uh, move. And this is what a typical robotic therapy result looks like. Um, so it works, and it's usually better than conventional therapy, but in average, not that much. So you can see uh, that in this case, it was about three, maybe four uh, points in the Fugelmeier scale. So I'm gonna talk about Fugelmeier scale a few times. In this case, it's a Fugelmeier scale for the upper extremity, so it's 33 different movements that therapists ask the patient to do, and they grade, they grade it from zero to two, so the maximum would be six to six points. So four, three points is not that much in that scale. Um, and you see that this is actually below what we call the clinically, So the clinically significant difference, which is about five points in the Fugelmeier scale. So when patients really see some difference in their daily activities. Uh, and in this study, we had 26 stroke survivors uh, either doing typical tabletop type of therapy or uh, using a robot doing uh, tasks similar to the video before. This is another uh, study. This is actually the largest ever robotic therapy study to date, and it was uh, done by the VA with the in motion to robot. Uh, again, similar, but in this case, instead of having the other one could go everywhere in the space, and this one is only like tabletop. So even more similar to what therapy could look like. And again, the results, yeah, robotic therapy has a little bit of advantage compared to conventional therapy, but it's really not that big of a difference. 
Okay. And, but why people usually prefer robotics? So it's easy to imagine that it's less boring to do therapy uh, with robotics and conventional therapy. Um, but the main answer that we got was a lady that said, if I can't do it once, why would I do it 100 times? And that's actually the main benefit of robotics. So uh, especially when we're talking about lower level uh, patients, we, we can give them the exact amount of support for them to complete the task successfully. And that success can actually be, play a big part in rehabilitation because uh, we need this feedback to the brain to, to actually have neuroplasticity. And we believe that through having plasticity, that's actually where, where we want to uh, have that rehabilitation that we need. And having plasticity is ba basically the brain saying, this thing that you just did, that's, that's good. Keep doing that. Work on that. So uh, it's just a way to give feedback saying that what we've done just now is right. And luckily, robotics have been more used uh, in therapy in, and in rehabilitation facilities later, but only in flagship type of facilities. And that's because most of the robots are still pretty expensive, and they can be very intimidating to use by both the therapists and uh, the patients. So for instance, this is Army Spring, which is to date the most successful uh, exoskeleton in use, and it's in about 700 rehabilitation facilities worldwide, which is a lot for robotics, but for, in terms of number of rehabilitation facilities, that's, that's so small. Well, and when we look back at those results from the robotic therapy, one thing that uh, is really striking is the size of those standard deviation bars. They're, they're really huge. So they're, they're actually sometimes larger than the effect itself. So that basically means some people are getting twice as much benefit from robotics than the average, where some other people are not getting any benefit from robotics. So they're basically wasting their time doing that type of therapy that really doesn't help them at all. And this is not true only for that study. It's true for most of the studies. So This, this was a very recent review with a bunch of uh, robotic therapy, so only upper extremity in this case. Sorry. Uh, only upper extremity. And these are the benefits of robotics. And you see the size of these standard deviation bars. They're all huge. And it, it comes to say, again, some people are benefiting a lot, but some people are not benefiting at all. So it is an important question to ask where that variability comes from and uh, how can we use maybe that in our advantage. So to discuss a little bit of that, uh, I'm gonna talk about two important results coming from this robot called the finger individuation grasp exercise robot. We're really lucky that it ended up being FINGER, the acronym. Uh, it can measure joint forces and it has like two, in this case it's only one, but usually the full robot has two eight linkage bars that basically uh, can make the movement of a grasping, a gripping type of movement with uh, the index and the middle finger. And it was designed by Eric Wolbridge that is now in the University of Idaho. And when we designed this robot, it was actually supposed to be measuring uh, proprioception. So proprioception is basically knowing the position of your body parts in relation to the other body parts. And with this robot, we wanted to, to try to find a nice way to measure that with stroke survivors. And we chose the hand because it, it has a very large somewhat sensory representation in the brain. So the first part of this study was a more uh, motor function type. So here we connected the, game, the robot with the third most uh, famous video game which is Guitar Hero. And so notes keep streaming down and patients have to hit the note at the right time doing the right type of movement. So we used only three notes. So they would do either 
index flexion, uh, middle finger flexion, or both fingers together. Uh, and when people had n no support from the robot at all, so no help from the robot, they got about 20% success rate for both, both groups that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and then we divided them into a high success group and the low success group. So for the high success group, we programmed the, the robot to help them to get exact, or to get around 80% success rate. And for the low level people, it was, for the low success rate, it was 50%. Okay? So the robot would basically wait for the person to start a movement and help them as much as they needed to get the note right to be at this percentage. And the nice thing about this setup is that we managed to get this exactly same dosing for both groups. And not surprisingly, actually the results look kind of the same. Um, the one difference is that the high assistant group actually managed to retain a lot of that, uh, of that benefit from therapy after the uh, three months of, of the therapy. Uh, and we believe that also comes from that having plasticity or having learning. Basically, is because the robot is helping them to finish that movement and really know that they are doing the right type of movement and the right type of activation in their brain. Um, the other point to make is that lower level patients improve better doing the, in the high level group. Higher level had the same, basically the same uh, type of benefit. And the second part of this study was looking at then proprioception. So we had this test. Uh, so in, in general, in, in, in clinics, how they measure proprioception is that the therapist will move the finger of the patient down or up, and without the patient looking, they'll have to say if it was moved up or down. Uh, in this, and, and that's very granular, so uh, you really don't, it's either right or wrong, and that's all you have. Uh, and what we try to do here is to get something a, a little bit more quantifiable. And how we did it is that the robot, so we cover the hand and the robot, and the robot starts moving their fingers kind of randomly, but always in a crisscross type of movement. And patients have to push a button when they think their fingers are aligned with each other. So basically, here you see the movement of both fingers. So the dashed line is one finger, the um, solid line is the other. And the perfect uh, place you push the button is every time they cross. And you can see that it moves around so the person doesn't really, it's not really that timed. Uh, so the time is always changing and the position where the fingers actually are crossing is different too. And one point to make is that a lot of people think that maybe this uh, could have something with uh, reaction time, but we measure that too. And uh, we, we had people being usually normally distributed around being too early or too late for doing, uh, pushing the button. So it's, it's really an anticipatory type of movement and uh, task. And then when we compare the proprioception error with their actual motor skill, we see that people that had very low proprioception uh, benefited a lot more from, from the therapy than people that had low proprioception. And actually this was almost 40%. So almost 40% of the variance in the motor skill came from how good her sensory system was. And we tested another 40 types of uh, outcomes to try to predict it and Sens the two first ones were sensory uh, type of outcomes, and they were actually more in the imaging side of the thing. So it was the somatosensory, uh, damage to the somatosensory system, and asymmetry in the somatosensory processing of the data uh, that were the best ones predicting that. Then if we separate those groups into the ones that do have good proprioception and the ones that don't have good proprioception, we start seeing that uh, Maybe the ones that did not have good proprioception were again just wasting their time being there for one hour, five days a week uh, trying to rehabilitate. Uh, where the ones that did have good proprioception managed to, to get a lot more out of it. Uh, 
And of course, there, uh, there are a few things that we can do. We can try to train for perception, which is something that no one has done yet. Or we can then use uh, type of regenerative type of therapies that uh, would improve for perception. And again, we think this, this result comes from, from that Habian plasticity. So the brain needs to know that when it tries to do something, if it did it right or not, to actually learn how um, to adapt and, neuro, uh, and create neuroplasticity. So we do think that these are the three parts that we need to, we need to have that reward and attention system simulation, but that can only happen uh, if our sensory system is working well and in combination with our motor system. And that's, that's where um, usually the benefits will come from. And so all of this part was to say that, yeah, robotic therapy works, uh, but it, there is, it, it's really variable and it needs uh, all of these three systems to be working together to actually get uh, the benefit that we want from these patients. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about regenerative rehabilitation after neurologic injury, and especially the robotics role in that. Um, so we saw that robotic therapy is effective, but it's very variable. And I'll show that some of the uh, emerging regenerative uh, type of therapies are also uh, pretty variable and don't output that great result without any therapy. So as, as it was pointed out at the beginning, we do believe that putting the two together is is the way to go, and especially with robotics, uh, we think it can play a big role on how much therapy people are getting and how much they can actually take advantage of these new connections that they are creating with regeneration. And uh, we've been collaborating with a few groups on that, and so the first one is in uh, Dallas with Hayes and Kiergert, where they are using uh, the vagal nerve you're kind of hijacking the vagal nerve to play this role of uh, neuromodulation and reward to the system. So what they did with uh, rats that had a spinal cord injury was to have them in a uh, isometric pool type of therapy, and they had they would stimulate the vagal nerve any time that they pushed it with a specific amount of force or above that type, uh, that amount of force. And they saw an improvement over therapy alone of more than 60%. And you can see that it's really about the timing of doing that, uh, that they pull the right amount and then you give the assimilation to the brain. Uh, because when they start changing the timing, so if it's a little bit delayed when they get that simulation, we already don't see uh, as much benefits. And if we do it at the wrong type of uh, movement, then the effects are almost none. I'm going to show you two of these animals. So the first one was doing rehab alone. So this is the amount of force they're producing, and these are the trials. So very little force, and these are the ones that got the stimulation after the 20 percent, uh, at the 20 percent grip force. So when they go over this uh, threshold is when they get this simulation. So really, really exciting. And because th the main thing here is that vagal nerve simulation is already a uh, commonly done procedure in humans. So it doesn't seem to be too difficult to actually translate it to humans. And we think that with robotics or wearable sensors, uh, we could that do that uh, in, in a very uh, sophisticated and nice way. This is another study by Reggie Edgerton and Dr. Lou at UCLA, where they are doing uh, epidural uh, stimulation, which seems to raise excitability of the dorsal roots and uh, help with the sensory system. So again, helping with that Havian plasticity. And they are using the Armio spring. I didn't mention that, but Armio spring also came uh, from Professor Rankinsmeyer's lab, and now it's produced in, in Switzerland. So uh, we're collaborating with them to use uh, the, that technology and here is the baseline of how much force they can produce with their hand before they start the, the simulation and the therapy. And this is uh, their improvement after. So these are just two patients that they have so far because these are implanted uh, simulators. And I know that they're doing a few more now. And they also have very good uh, improvement in daily 
daily activities as well. And another one similar was uh, Sumner Norman, he was in our lab and worked with uh, John Wopel in New York, um, doing BCI, a BCI paradigm for, um, for rehabilitation. And what he did was actually train people to uh, use their, he trained how to use the ERD, so the event relay desynchronization in the brain, before they actually started therapy. So they basically learned how to activate their brain, just the activation before actually doing the movement, before they started therapy. And just doing that seems to, to help with motor function as well. So the black ones are the ones that actually learn how to use the system, because um, doing BCI takes, takes a lot of training and brain power. But, uh, so after they learned that, it helped with uh, motor function. And we, we believe one of the reasons is because when they do manage to get that, that target ERD, it already gives it some, uh, it, it raises the amount of attention that uh, patients are uh, taking to, to, to the movement, and that helps with neuroplasticity again. Okay, all of that is enhancing neuroplasticity, but what about regeneration? So we've worked with Professor uh, Mark Tuzinski at UCSD, uh, and you guys know this type of figure a lot better than I do, but I, I find them just fascinating. And this is um, around the C4 for um, a spinal cord injured rat, and in green are human accents Go, that were grafted into this the lesion right here going into the host spinal cord. So this is just uh, really, really amazing. However, when we look at how that affects function, again, it, it's not that much. Uh, so, okay, there, there is some benefit, and it's actually, the benefits are very similar to the benefits of robotic therapy alone. Um, but it's not as, when you see all of these new connections, uh, there seems to be so much more to be, uh, to come out of it. And, well, they did this for monkeys as well. So this is um, for rhesus macaque, and they had a, an injury at the C7 over here, and there are like hundreds of thousands of new neurons, uh, new, new connections here. Uh, and, but when you look again at how, how that affects the functional outcome, it, it's very little. So in all the three metrics and the combination of them, uh, it, it, they are statistically different, but uh, small in comparison to what, what it seems it could be. And how robotics would, or rehabilitation would play a role there. So of course, uh, with new connections, you'd have to learn how to use those. So that's that's kind of an obvious one, but something else that Professor Tuzinski worked on was looking at actual neurons around uh, the lesion site, just doing therapy. With this, there's no stem cells or anything, but just therapy. And there, there is a big change in the structure of those neurons uh, with therapy alone. And that then facilitates these new connections that are bringing, not just to relearn these connections, but also to connect with the host. So that seems to be a big thing. and how robotics plays a role. So we developed, in partnership with them, this uh, robot that's called the bimanual vending machine that is trying to deliver intense in-cage rehabilitation uh, for the hand and that is gradable so that can be used uh, for lower level, uh, low level patients and higher level patients. And the challenge is, uh, to make it engaging so animals can do it for a long time, and especially to make it robust because they break it a lot. Um, so a little bit of how, what this machine actually is. So there, there are two main components to it. One is the handle on this side, which, uh, which is touch sensitive, so uh, we know when they're touching that handle, they can rotate, they can push and pull, uh, and they can grip it. And as they interact with that handle, the reward cart here that has a yogurt covered racing or any other type of treats that they like uh, will start moving forward and deliver that, um, that reward. So 
So here I'm going to show you how one of these animals using this robot. This one learned to grip, and you see that the reward card keeps going back and forth because we can set up different probabilities of when they actually get that reward. Because if you want to have it for a very extended period of time, you cannot deliver that many treats as they, they need to keep, they keep, keep that nice shape. Uh, and if we look at another guy, so here, for both of these animals, we let them choose what type of uh, exercise they want to do. So this one chose to pull and push. But we also did a few experiments on how, how we can try to shape what they're doing. So uh, we can change the amount of contribution of each of these type of exercises to the movement of that reward cart. Uh, and we can then ch move them from doing groups to pulling and pushing. And this, this handle doesn't have the rotation part anymore, uh, but we, we could translate them into doing rotations as well. So that's, that's pretty amazing. And they, they keep engaged. So you can see that this guy had only 10% chance of getting a reward. And he keeps going at it. Uh, and we think it has a big component of a slot machine. So it's like going to Vegas. But the most amazing part is that it works for very low level patients too. So because it's touch sensitive, we can, at this point we can say just, yeah, get your hand out, touch it, and it's, it's something. And as they start progressing, we can change how the robot behaves to expect them to move the handle a little, then to grip it a little. Um, and they really, they really love it. The, uh, the hardest part is to take it off of their cage. And how does it look when we compare to the standard therapy? So fortunately, there is not much of a standard therapy for monkeys. Uh, the main one is Brinkman's board or a different combination of Brinkman's board. So there are just a few uh, different, uh, w different shapely wells that have rewards inside. And monkeys have to do a pinch grip to get those rewards out of the, those wells. Uh, but it's basically one movement for each, uh, for each reward, which is kind of a big deal. So if we look at treat efficiency, uh, we can get a lot more movements out of uh, these animals for each treat, which is important for them to keep uh, their weight. And it's also sometimes very difficult for them because it, it needs this uh, kind of a very fine control type of movement to, to do the pinch grip and remove the rewards. Um, so with the BVM, we can, we can get them doing uh, therapy from very after, right after uh, SCI until they are very uh, well recovered. And we can get a lot more dosage as well, and just intensity, but the, usually Brinkman board can only stay for like a minute or two minutes. Uh, so even though the intensity of that one minute is pretty high, you can't really have it running for hours in a day. And as I said, it can be used before and after SCI, and they're basically using it the same amount. It, of course, it changes in uh, the grip strength and uh, how much they pull and push, how much they can rotate. Uh, but in actual interaction with the robot, it's pretty similar before and after SCI, as you can see here. And, and we can also use it a little bit for assessment tools, too. So, so this is uh, their grip force before, after, uh, before SCI and after SCI. So we can see a big change in how much grip they can generate. And you may have noticed the two extra bars here. This is for an animal called Churchill uh, that was our golden star. That After six months of graft, uh, he started improving a lot. And after he started using the robot particularly, he had a big improvement in amount of grip force. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have his data for before SCI because when, when we started with the robot, he was already, uh, he, he was already grafted. Uh, but it, it does seem to have a very uh, interesting impact on him. And yeah, so, so it does seem essential to, to combine activity with regeneration, and that seems to have uh, the effect that we, we want so much. But again, it, it needs that motor effort, some sensory type of integrity, and it needs to have rewards every time they do the right thing. And finally, so are we giving the right dose? So we, we already have, uh, we know that robot-based therapy kind of works, 
uh, for some cases it's variable, but uh, it works. We know that we need to put re regeneration and uh, therapy together, but how much therapy do we actually need? So this was a study by Jeffers and colleagues uh, looking at reaches per day in rats. So again, uh, this was a spinal cord injured rat. And what they noticed is that you only start seeing some actual effect after 300 movements per day. And this is doing five times a week of therapy and one hour for them, I think it was one hour of therapy. And when we compare it to what we're doing with the BVM, so at this, at right now we are doing only 15 minutes per week. So we're about where things start to get uh, really change. But we're, we're increasing those to probably one hour a week. But Brinkman board, those first results that we saw were over here. So really at the beginning of that curve. And when we ask where, where are we with humans then? So this is a study by um, Catherine Lang, and she set out to achieve very high dosage of therapy. So these are four, uh, four times a week therapy, one hour therapy, um, but doing very, very intensive therapy. So, and they set out to do four groups. So one group was 3,200 movements per week, the other one 6,400, 9,600, and this one is uh, one that they did just as much as they could in, in, in one week, or in one, one hour therapy. And actually, and these are functional outcomes, so there's almost no difference. Um, and this is just doing as much as we can with our traditional therapy. And if, if human dosage looks anything like rats, it, it kind of makes sense. We're still in this flat part of therapy, and we need just so much more repetitions in a day. And how can we get there? Uh, we think that what we need to find is innovative type of technologies that people can use at home. Because just the time at, at the clinic is not enough to do all the, the movements that they need to do. And this is, this is a product now called Music Love, but it came out of our lab with uh, Nitsan and Professor Mark Bachman. And so it's again playing Guitar Hero. And in this, this glove has a few pads that are touch sensitive. So people have to do different grips to reach each note. And from the study using this music love, we got our favorite plot, which is this is what we asked patients to do, and this is what they, what they actually did. So that's really amazing. And this big part of this is just because it's, it's fun, it's engaging, uh, and they can do it whenever they want. So if they want to do more than that one hour that they were set to do, they can do it. And that's kind of what we want them to do. Uh, the problem with that one is that when people start calling that startup that started from our lab, only one out of eight of those calls could actually use the music glove. It requires a lot of dexterity. Um, so now we're trying to come up with different type of exercise, uh, devices that are a little bit more motivation, motivating and that let people with lower level uh, exercise. So yeah, you can see this lady here and every time she does what she should do, uh, something will happen there. And this is how we see like the vagal simulation, uh, nerve simulation being used. So every time they do it, the right movement, we can send a signal and simulate the brain saying, yeah, well, well done, that's, that's what you should be doing. And you can see that guy in the back going at it. And there, there are like 40 different types of movements that they can do, either like with the trunk, um, stepping on it, and all different things. And always with like a simple interface that they can use at home. And finally, this is another project that I'm working on, which is called the Manometer. So it's similar to a Fitbit, but instead of counting steps, it counts number of hand movements. So what we did is to look at uh, intensive therapy and see how many counts they would get in an hour, and then e extrapolate that for a day, and ask them to wear that device and try to get to that daily goal uh, of amount of activity. 
So far, we only had uh, six people completing the study, or not even completing, the, we're still waiting for follow-up. Uh, but during the three weeks of therapy, the, the, the wanton experimental group got 15,000 extra hand movements compared to what they did in their baseline. So it's, it's starting to get there in number of repetitions. And that's, that's what we see when we bring it back to that curve. Again, imagining that the human does curve would look something similar to to the rat one, uh, but it, it does seem that we, we, we need this extra dosage that people can do at home in their own time with innovative type of technologies. Uh, so a little bit review of uh, what I tried to convey today. So um, robotic therapy works, but it's very variable, and indeed all the three systems, motor, sensory, and rewarding system, working together to, to have the benefit uh, regenerative technology um, therapies are also in the same boat, but we think that putting the two together is where things are going to look, start to look interesting. And dosage, we still need to find better ways to get more dosage. Of course, therapy is great, but we still, that's just not enough time and enough repetitions that people are doing in the clinic, even when we try to do it as much as we can. So with that, I'm just going to show this video that Professor Rankins my really likes of our 300 and something students that I'm the TA for. All right. Thank you. <laughs>